I've just put two examples of uh, the uses of kaolin, a clay, white clay. The first one, kaolin's used for ceramics and production of china. It's also used uh, for paint and, and plastic and fillers and uh, those sorts of things. But it's the same mineral, but the compositions and specifications that are required for those two uses are quite different. You can see the the percentages of uh, allowable material, uh, allowable chemical uh, compositions are quite different. The, um, <clears throat> the brightness requirements are different. Um, so you need to understand what use your potential client is going to put your industrial mineral to. So those two examples are just there to show that all kaolin's not kaolin. Let's look at the case study at Scarden River. Um, a kaolin project in, uh, on the west of uh, Cape York in northern Queensland in Australia. The kaolin deposits exist beneath bauxite in, the, in that area. You'd probably be all, all be aware of the Weeper bauxite deposits. Scarden River is just a little bit further uh, south than, than Weeper. And in the, in the bauxite, in the process of producing bauxite, it also produces a clay layer underneath. And this garden kaolin looked pretty, attra pretty attractive. In the 1990s, a company called Australian Kaolin tried to develop the deposit but collapsed after spending $100 million building a plant. And the plant didn't, didn't work. It didn't produce a product that was saleable. And this is another distinction between industrial minerals and, and uh, normal uh, metals mining. If you build, build a gold plant and it doesn't work as well as it should have, you, you designed it, and it's producing a recovery of 80% instead of 93%, you're still going to get paid for the 80% of gold you recover. If you produce an industrial minerals plant that doesn't produce something of specification, you don't get anything. There's no, there's no oh, we'll, we'll, take the, we'll take that as second best. No, it doesn't meet specifications. It's not saleable. So it's really, it is that, I just mentioned that to emphasise, here's a company that spent $100 million developing a mine, building a plant. The plant didn't produce the, the material that was of a specification required. In fact, I understand that, uh, that the specification that was required wasn't actually understood when the plant was built. And so the plant produced what it was supposed to produce, but it wasn't something that could be sold. So in 2001, another company called Minerals Corporation had taken over the operation and announced that it had begun uh, production at the plant. But in 2005, it uh, became clear that it had failed to meet product specifications as well, and we'll look at why in a minute. There's been several other attempts to produce kaolin. In 2012, the company was placed in administration, the assets dispersed, the tenements have been sold to a company that's interested in the bauxite that's overlying the kaolin. The kaolin's almost now forgotten. So the lesson out of that is to ensure that the product specifications and the processing route meet the market. We've probably got something like $150 million sunk in, in two plants, two small plants there in North Queensland that haven't produced anything of, of value. So the kaolin has to be mined, degridded, pumped, and pump 16 kilometres through a slurry pipeline, then put through a dry plant where it is dried, bagged and shipped. And Minerals Corporation hit, uh, hit trouble at each one of those steps along the way. And the pictures are just the, the kaolin on this side and the paper which uh, was designed to be a fillerfore or thought to be a fillerfore on, on your right. The kaolin uh, contained a high percentage of grit and it took ages, this is out of a report, took ages to get a degritter. So to actually get the grit out of the kaolin was, was something that took some time. The company didn't have the right bagging equipment and because of the location, they then had to barge the material over a sandbar in uneconomic batches. So transport was a difficulty for them, getting the, the material onto a boat to take it to market. The kiln that was uh, designed to, to uh, improve the quality of the kaolin and the spray dryer didn't work. The kiln's 60 metres long. It's a large piece of equipment in northern Australia, but it doesn't work satisfactorily. And the primary reason was that the bricks inside the kiln, this is a, a, a kiln, a heated process that heats the kaolin, 
they had a habit of falling into the kaolin, which meant the nice white kaolin that emerged from the end of the calcina was mixed with finely ground particles of concrete. Now, nobody wants finely ground particles of concrete in their newspaper. So, um, not, not, not you or the paper manufacturers. So then there's an absence of bias. So then there was an absence of bias for what was produced. And I take that out of a Pierpont article in 2005. So the conclusions that I'd like to make are that uh, the ability to meet the specifications for a marketable, marketable product is paramount. So that's the critical thing with industrial minerals. You have to be able to meet the criteria for, or to meet the specifications for a marketable product. Ensuring the project is located near to the, to the marketable product, near to the market for the product is paramount. Perhaps if you've got a higher value product, you can produce that at a profit into a competitive market a, a distance away, but that's all a balancing act. In estimating and reporting of kaolin, it's not simply enough to report the resource in, in terms of contained industrial mineral. You have to ensure that the specifications for those minerals as defined are, are matched rather than just relying on traditional mineralogical and chemical analyses. So what are the risks and opportunities? If the raw material properties are not understood and the processing route is not able to convert the raw material into a saleable product, then the project's at risk of being a failure, as in Scarden River. That Scarden River case shows that it's not just a matter of tweaking the plant for industrial minerals, it's generally a case of write off and start again. So the risk is significant if you get it wrong. Industrial minerals underpin industrial development. Even in poor economic swings, there's still a significant demand for industrial minerals. There's still demand for dimension stone. There's still demand for paper filler. There's still demand for paint filler. That demand is very much smoother than it is for, for base metals. So that the industrial minerals market would generally be smoother than the normal mining market. A well-run project with the ability to meet changing market conditions and specifications can provide good returns through the, through the normal economic cycle. 